Welcome back to Masonry Studio. I'm David Abrams, founder and CEO of Masonry. Nearly a year ago, I decided I wanted to start making videos and I was exploring what was out there. And I started watching this forever 18. By the end of it, I was crying and realized this is my friend's brother, Nofi, that put together this insane video. And I reached out and I said, dude, I gotta start making things. I have about three weeks before I wanna make the first one. Can we do this? And you said, let's, let's go. It's gonna be focused on real estate. Real estate's in your blood. Storytelling is in your blood. And I get that. But I recognize that I don't know a lot about you. So I said, get out from behind that lens. Sit down with me. Let's do this. Let's find a cool spot sitting in 16, 1601 Washington in South Beach. Starwood's old headquarters. I'm marketing the retail space downstairs. We've talked about this building. Let's just do it there. So thank you for everything you've done, the fun that we have, the craziness that we, the effort we put into these things. But how did you fall in love with this? It's cool to be on the other side of the camera. You know, I'm usually behind it. And for it to be on me, it's just, it's special. So thanks for giving me this opportunity. I remember I was traveling around Israel with my super close friend, Jordan Stauber, and he was holding his camera like this, right by his chest. And he was taking these incredible photos. And something that I noticed was it wasn't breaking the moment at all. He never said, guys, turn around, put your arms around each other's shoulders. It was just natural grabbing those shots. And I found that to be such a beautiful way to capture the memories and tell the stories of our wacky adventures around Israel. And I thought, I gotta try this out too. And I was in commander's course and I bought myself a little bar mitzvah camera, uh, point and shoot. And I wanted to make a video called A Day in the Life of a Tanker. And I shot all my videos and I told Jordan, can you edit it for me? He told me, you have to edit it. I made this video and I absolutely fell in love with editing. That's a good friend. And to date, that's the video that has the most views and the most traction and the least amount of editing skills possible. So that, that should show creator something. So you mentioned the army. What was that experience like? What's something that you take, that you took with you from that experience that will live with you for the rest of your life? The experience was everything. It was hot, it was cold, it was tired, it was hungry, it was rewarding, it was extremely frustrating at points. And I feel like what I've really taken away from the army was understanding what hard work is and tackling it. And hard work is everywhere. It could be in taking care of your child and it could be in the military, it, but you don't have to be in that framework. When you're in the desert for three weeks in a row and basically all you've eaten is cans of tuna, just straight up from the can, and you finally get back to base and they need someone to volunteer for kitchen duty or they need someone to volunteer to stay home for the weekend. To muster up the courage to be able to raise your hand and volunteer to stay home for that weekend, now that's hard work. And that's really courage in putting yourself out there. And another really interesting, and everybody answers discipline. So that's not the answer that I wanna give. Another really interesting experience in the army was commander's course. I was, instead of being receiving, I was able to give. I was able to give to new recruits and command them on the first day in the military. And I was really able to shape their experience and show them my passion for the military and my passion for what I was doing there. And that was really special to be able to teach. So command, we're always talking about videos. Do you actually prefer to be behind the camera or run the show, be the commander? Honestly, I believe that story is king and I'm not a super technical person. So I love to kind of command the show and direct, but I feel like that's a lot, how a lot of creators start. Um, they could start with the camera in their hands and eventually they go on to bigger and better things because everyone has their unique ability. And I've learned this a lot from my dad and my uncle speaking about strategic coach. 
you have your unique ability and you need to understand what that is and you need to have other people in your network with other abilities that you don't necessarily have. You're not able to grow a giant retail brokerage company yourself. You need other people around you. So I have found my skill in directing and storytelling. So that's why I really like to kind of command in a way, but not with that discipline and all that stuff that you have to do in the military. You're always exploring different bodies of water. You love to travel. What is your drive for travel? What is your want for travel? I think that the world is my teacher. Um, it sounds kind of funny, but really when I'm traveling, it's taking myself out of my comfort zone. I'm putting myself in situations that are sometimes pretty wacky <laughs> in foreign countries with brand new people that I've met and committed to work on their farm, make a film for them. Um, I often use film as a way to help fund my travels. And I'm able to learn from every single person that I meet, whether it's the fly fishing guide in Slovenia or the person with the farm in Portugal. And to see their viewpoint and to see their experiences speaking through them, I'm able to learn so much. And I don't care if I'm with someone my age and my religion and my ethnicity, or if I'm with an 82 year old sheep herder in Montana. So Montana, I know you can speak the language, but <laughs> we've talked where you're in a country not able to communicate with the people you're filming. What is that like? Not just the struggle of, you know, where to stand, how to talk, but is there a loneliness factor there? There's definitely a loneliness factor in travel itself, even if it's where I do understand the language. Um, I have a friend named Ohad, and he's kind of like a travel blogger. And what he talks about when he's traveling alone, what does that mean? That means you're just leaving your home alone, your, your place of origin alone. But on the road, you meet so many people, and they can teach you so much, and you have such a good time. And the beauty of traveling alone is that if you don't want to be with them anymore, you just part ways and meet new people. But if you want that solitude, if you want that peace and quiet in the wilderness in Montana, you can get it. So loneliness is definitely a factor, but sometimes I kind of want that. I respect that. <laughs> so we talk about loneliness, the difficulty being in the army. I get how you went through struggle. How do you deal with struggle now in this stage of life? Oftentimes, I turn to nature. When I'm standing in front of the Grand Tetons, approximately 13,700 feet tall, you feel how small you are. You feel how insignificant you are. And of course, every single person is important, but it puts it into perspective and comparison. And it's also the pure peace and quiet of just being, of just being completely present. And that's why I love nature. That's why I love fishing, because that's who we are at our core. That's what's ingrained in our DNA, in our ancestors' DNA. And once you're out there in that peace and quiet, you realize that that drama, that fight that you had with your business partner, with your friend, you realize that that's just noise. And our mutual friend Anna spoke about that. She speaks about cutting the noise. The way I look at it is that those things that take me away from feeling present, that's just noise. And those things that are hurt and pain, and you could cut that out. And of course you have to work with it and deal with it, but cutting out the noise is a huge help. And also being close to nature, you understand how fragile life is. You see, and not to be graphic, but you see an animal kill another animal. And when you realize how fragile life is, are you gonna wake up every single day and look in the mirror and cry and hate yourself? Or are you just gonna go out there and have this zest for life and tackle everything with just passion and love and opening up your heart? It's kind of like a waste 
and I get the drive for money and I come from a, commu a community where we have that drive for money, but in the end of the day, what's it for? Is it, because if it's just for that money, it's kind of never ending. But if it's to support your family and to gift the causes that you love and to be comfortable, then that's an idea that I can connect to. And honestly, that's why I'm doing what I'm doing right now. Because I don't have that extreme drive to just build wealth at this moment in my life. I want to experience and live hard and meet incredible people. And I want to tell stories. I want to share those stories with other people and hopefully be able to kind of give some of these insights that I'm telling you that I've learned to other people. You talked about support, family. There's something that I recognize about everyone in your family. It's the importance of philanthropy. Where did that come from? I've actually never asked anybody in the family. You all find it to be such an important thing. I agree with it, but what, who, where did that come from? My family really believes that what goes around comes around. And it sounds cliche, but it's so true. When you're able to give, you're also able to receive. And I've seen throughout the years of my dad and my uncles and my cousins conducting business, they had given so much money to the charities that they believed in. And that's only led them to good things. That's only led them to more business opportunities. When they're alongside wealthy individuals who are giving money, they're doing business with those people. What's the charity that's important to you? So my cousin JD in uh, Herzliya, Israel at uh, Rechman University, he runs a uh, program called Yisrael Shebalev, Israel at Heart. And what it really does is break a generational cycle. What do I mean by that? It takes Ethiopian Israelis and it puts them through university, through law school. What happened was when Israel brought in all the Ethiopian Jews, oftentimes those Ethiopians in their beginnings were poor. They came to Israel with nothing. And they only spoke Amharic. Their children in the next generations would drop out of school and help their parents work. They weren't getting the proper education. They weren't getting the proper scores on their uh, standardized testings. So then they weren't getting into colleges and then they weren't getting good jobs. And they were staying in this cycle of poverty. But what Yisrael Shebalev does is it puts them through university based off of their army experience and based off of their personal interview. Nothing to do with their standardized testing scores, which is just, it's just mind blowing that somebody can move out of that mindset of what's the score that they got on the test, but can see, were they an officer in an infantry unit? I'm friends with many of these students and to just see the impact, it's just remarkable. I want to tell you a good story. I went on a program through Yeshiva University when I was in college and they divided us. Some went to work with Russians, others with Ethiopians. And it was a 10 day program. The amount that I learned about both cultures experience coming into Israel was mind blowing. I stayed extra uh, after the trip and a friend of mine met up with me. He had flown in from New York and we're walking and we had to Davin Mincha, pray the afternoon service. We didn't know where, where to go. And I see an Ethiopian security guard and I'm like, hey, wait one second, let me just go ask him. He goes, dude, are you serious? He's not gonna know? I'm like, you are very ignorant. Give me a second. And we walk up to the guy and I'm like, Efo Mincha, where's Mincha? Where's this prayer service? He goes, 315 there, four o'clock there, you got a 515 and you might have a six there. And my friend's jaw dropped and he goes, what just happened? And I said, you really need to learn the story and get color out of your head. You said, hey, to dude. I'll translate for some of the audience that may not understand meditation. And I, it's funny because I do get this a lot. Like what life work balance, you gotta do this, you gotta do that. Thank God, bro, I am at Zen. I deal with a lot of personalities and you've heard some of the war stories that I talk about but it all starts with my morning process. You're talking about me being at the beach. I sit down after my, my whole process, I write down a thought of the day. 
I don't care how much difficulty I have to go through during that day. I took out the garbage at the beginning of the day. My mind was reset and I have an unfair advantage. I have a weekly holiday every single Saturday. Yeah. Shabbat to me is my phone is off Friday afternoon till Saturday night. And so that to me is like 36 hours of a reset on a weekly basis. That's all I need to do to go. Um, and we've talked about it. Like I, I grew up on nothing, you know, and I saw how hard my, my mother worked and, and siblings and my father not to, you know, take any day for granted and just give it your all. Uh, so I definitely recognize that, but I truly love what I'm doing and it just, it pushes me to keep going and push harder. Yeah, I recognize uh, your hardships growing up in food stamps and I recognize that's what pushes you so hard that you don't want to have to go through that and you don't want to put your family through that. And I admire that hard work and I admire how you tackle it. And Well, you just made me think about something because the Tara is sure. standing behind the camera right now and she won't come in front. But it was something that came up in the interview with Anna. When I turned 30, I had this quarter life crisis and I was going through this whole discovery of who am I, what am I meant to do in this world? And I, I met with a lot of friends, mentors, people I really respected, and I came to a conclusion. I'm a vehicle of God here to earn money to pass on as charity. So if I am simply here as a conduit, why should I fail? How can I fail? So it's not just that I'm working for myself, I'm working for the others, and I, I think that really speaks to what you were saying on, on charity. Working to give. Yeah. That's a really special way of looking at it that isn't so clear from the outside always to anybody looking in. It kind of shows you, you know, that you can't judge a book by its cover. You can't just jump to these conclusions. You don't know what people's motivations are, what they've been through, where they're trying to go to. So you mentioned details. We always think about details. We spent, I don't know how long setting up the audio and now your watch beeps, all of our phones are off. Time, there's a limited amount of time in this world and you have to choose what you work on. You've made incredible videos for law firms, for real estate firms, for people with farms in the middle of America. What is your passion? What videos do you want to be producing, stories you want to be telling? I really want them to be able to revolve around the outdoors because that's really what I'm passionate about. But in the end of the day, and it sounds cliche, it's telling unique stories. I want to find that interesting person who's self-sustaining, he's hunting, he's fishing, He's doing something amazing for his community. I want to be able to tell those unique stories and share that with the world in order for other people to be able to take something away from there. To be able to take something away from there and implement it in their own lives. And when I'm doing personal videos, these passion projects about my own travels, it's kind of the same goal because I think I've found something. I found this beauty in that nature, in the travel, in how humbling and educating it can be. And I really want to be able to share that. Thank you. You're the man. I appreciate the, uh, just everything. I mean, you've allowed me to, you've helped me travel, really, because I'm able to make money while I travel. And so you may not know it, but you've been a vehicle to allow me to travel. I was living in Madrid for three months and on a farm in Portugal with no service or no Wi-Fi, and you stuck with it. And I was able to be making videos with you. So 
I am appreciative of that as well. Thank you. And speaking of appreciation, I realize I never know how to close these things. So I'm gonna say it like this. Say whatever you want. It's not, we don't gotta do anything for the camera. Filmed by Atara Wolf, edited by Nofi Janae, produced by David Abrams and Masonry <laughs> Studio. Thank you, brother. Peace.